Hello everyone, I'm John Atak and I'm very pleased to welcome my dear friend and colleague Francis Peters. Hello Francis. Hi John. Now, Francis works as a, a counsellor helping people who've been involved in authoritarian groups uh, in Holland um, but through the magic of technology she can talk to people anywhere in the known world. So um, how long have you been counselling now? Francis, how many years? Oh, I was uh, a late starter because of being in a cult for so long. Mm. <laughs> so it's, uh, I started in 2010. 2010. And yes. before that, you had 40-something years experience. <laughs> in in the, the cultic group, yes. Yeah, and, and that was the um, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, more generally known as the Jehovah's Witnesses or J-dubs by yes. some people. Um, yeah. And of course, it, it it's very helpful, you know, to have to have had the experience if you're going to help other people to deal with it. It it, it you know, so in bereavement counselling, for example, or in relationship counselling, it's quite good to have had a relationship uh, if you know how to do something about it. Um, yeah. And we're returning to a, a subject that that we will continue to discuss, which is how to recognise that somebody you love, um, a family member, a friend, has become involved with a group that is dangerous or deleterious to them and how to spot that quickly and what you can do about it. Because often the problem is that by the time you try and do something about it, it's late on and it's very difficult to do anything. Now, such groups can vary completely from... Um, you know, commercial groups, multi-level marketing groups, large group awareness trainings like yeah. the Forum or Landmark Trust, um, therapy groups which are proposing that they're going to um, cure all of your ills, um, spiritual groups that, that are going to lead you to heaven and righteousness or, or, or a happy reincarnation. There are political groups like the LaRouches, followers of Lyndon LaRouche, or indeed the neo-Nazis, and terrorist groups. Um, okay. I spent a lot of time studying terrorist groups in the 1990s, before 9-11, and uh, let me just wave this book at, at the children. Um, this has recently come out, and it has a chapter in it. It's an Oxford University Press book. <laughs> wow. Mm, wow. Wonderful. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, it has a chapter in it, which I co-authored uh, with three other people, including Stephen Hassan. And in, in there, what our concern was to look at how people are being radicalised online, and they don't even necessarily join a group. They become part of what they call leaderless resistance. Yeah. But it, it's, the first thing is to look at those changes that, that occur in somebody that, that signal that, that you need to be concerned and you need to start learning about the subject. So do you want to talk a little about those signs? Yeah, it's, it's often when people come to me, uh, especially family or, or loved ones of a person who, who uh, yeah, then becomes clear that they are part of a cultic group or they say, well, we want to talk about this. Is this person really in a cultic group? Um, often they already it's, it's years after the fact so it's it's by the time that there is a lot of financial damage done or a lot of emotional damage done or the person is already completely isolated from the family and is very very much involved with the group mm -hmm. and then they started to realize oh my god what, what's, what's happening here but the signs beforehand is that they often say well uh, how good it would be if we knew beforehand or recognizing these signals so we knew what to do about this mm. but uh, then they start uh, to explain uh, what in hindsight these signals were mm. and they they uh, have uh, a lot to do with the things we're already uh, talking about so, like somebody is um, yeah, it's, it's closing themselves off from contact, getting more and more um, uh, fanatic about the convictions of the group, 
or the, the, the lifestyle they want to, to, to live. Uh, they are um, maybe you know, changing their hair and changing their way of speaking. It's, it's, not, it's not that serious, of course, but it's all, uh, all adding up. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, the change, a change of appearance can be a little obvious. You know, if they join the yeah. Krishnas and suddenly have just a little ponytail of hair. Exactly. You exactly. can guess that they've yeah. done it. But it's a way of thinking. It's the way of looking at things, becoming uh, extremely fanatical in a certain idea that's absolutely the truth and nothing mm -hmm. you can say will, will doubt them uh, about the, those, those convictions. Um, they, they're becoming for more dogmatic about things. Um, more insistent. Um, more insistent, yes, that's a better word for it. Uh, most of the time when they start being very excited about the group, teaching them how to be more conscious or uh, um, more self-aware of things, uh, developing as a person, so they go to um, trainings uh, of, of becoming more themselves, huh? as they mm -hmm. say, well, that, that is all can be very benign. Yeah, yeah. self-aware. So it can be really benign and nothing to do with it. Uh, meditation groups, um, yoga, all kinds of things that uh, are seemingly very, very innocent. But the more a person is losing all the other roles that they have in life, mm -hmm. um, then it becomes clear that the person is uh, no longer wants to be part of the family. Uh, if they go along with them and they actually want to join the group too, of course, then it's uh, yeah, absolutely delighted. But if, if people don't agree with them anymore, then they become more and more isolated uh, uh, and closer to the group, getting more and more involved, spending more money at the group. And there are so many things that you can see how they uh, uh, change, but the family, most of the time, and friends don't take it very seriously, mm. but but thinking, oh, it's just a phase, and uh, that will pass, and uh, and they adapt also to the ideas because, of course, we are all free to think new ideas, and and um, just part of their development. Exactly. So they it's they're not seeing anything serious in it or damaging, mm. uh, but later on it becomes clear that they get more and more involved and then uh, there's no going back or it seems so becoming more hostile against the family more hostile against their ideas uh, becoming more black and white thinking in the us versus them uh, yeah so those uh, ideas are not taken very seriously by the family because there is in society often um no room for thinking about this, uh, say, seeing how dangerous it can be to become so involved with the group that you change, have to change so many things that up until then were completely normal and acceptable, but then all of a sudden it's, it becomes like an enemy. And so taking that seriously in what are you involved with and to look at the group that they are involved with, maybe coming along with them, seeing what it's all about, uh, reading about uh, what, what cultic groups are, what the, the signs are of a cultic group. And to, to, because you can, as a family member, not being that involved as a person, can look at it more from the outside. So let, let me enter a caveat here. Uh, yeah. When I became involved in Scientology and Oh, 1974, that's yeah. how old I am. Um, my mother, um, I, I, I became involved in Birmingham in England, the middle centre of England, and I then moved down to Sussex, where the headquarters of Scientology was. I was never a live-in member, uh, um, which, about which I'm tremendously grateful. Yes, um, makes a difference. It makes an enormous difference, because if the environment you're in, the milieu, the group around you are all believing something and you're for you know you're sleep deprived and you don't have enough food and things like that it really does make a yes. incredible difference I, that never happened to me I was very lucky but I moved down to the south and my mum 
and uh, well, she, I think she'd been 58 at the time. She was, um, she'd been um, a town councillor. Um, she was um, a leading light in the local Conservative Party. She was a member for 23 years until Margaret Thatcher became leader and she resigned. So there you go. There's a little note. But so, you know, she was a well-respected member of, of the community and, um, you know, middle class and a two-car family and all of that kind of stuff. Um, sm smart woman, uh, even though she'd left school at 14 to go to work, you know, and was from a working class background. She was a very intelligent woman and a very kind and compassionate woman. And so she decided, well, the best thing to do is to go and have a look. I won't tell John. I'll go and have a look at Scientology and I'll, I'll see if it's dangerous to him. Now, the upshot is that, that she joined and was a member for eight years. So <laughs> yeah, you have to have a certain caution that these groups can have um, quite invasive recruiting techniques. But the, the first thing I read after I'd left, the first thing I read that was about um, exploitative persuasion, coercive control, undue influence, yeah. brainwashing, mind control. There's, there's so many of these words out there. The first thing I read was Conway and Siegelman, um, Flo Conway and Jim Siegelman, an, an article about, uh, which is called Information Disease. And out of that came a book called Snapping, which was a best-selling book in the 70s that they revised in 1990. It it has some very useful information, but it puts mm -hmm. forward an idea which which I still find problematic. Um, you know, though you know they've both been supportive of my work, so I don't want to be unpleasant about them uh, because I think that the, what they did was very interesting. But they put forward the idea that there was an epidemic of sudden personality change. Yeah, it, I think we have to be careful with the word epidemic there. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be careful with the word sudden, that often what happens is gradual. Um, but that, you know, because we live in a liberal society and looking back, it's not so long since people were being burned at the stake for refusing to believe what they were told. So the yeah. idea that we're trying to create a society that burns far less people at the stake, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully none. Um, yeah. the, <laughs> we'll say so. Exactly. So this idea of, of liberal society, secular society, where, where uh, people can have different beliefs, which, which I'm totally for. I think as long as people's beliefs are not antisocial towards yeah. destroying other people, I don't really mind how whether they believe in a God or gods or, or no God or, you know, just on a Tuesday, there's a God or, or, or whatever they believe in. I really don't mind as long as they believe in it in a way that, that accepts a compassionate view of other human beings. As soon as they want to dispense of existence, as Robert J. Lifton called it, and destroy other people or, or give other people lesser, a lesser set of rights than yeah. they have, then I become alarmed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, ultimately, many of these groups, and let's put a number on it, there are probably two, two or 3,000 um, extreme authoritarian groups that have been named in the world. And when you get down into the one-on-one -on -one cults where one person controls another, family cults, there is an incredible yeah. amount of these things. So the thing is, and so you can, somebody may become involved with a new boyfriend and yeah. one sees a change in behavior, that, that they are less receptive, they are more dismissive of other people, yeah. There can sometimes be actually be phys physical and physiological signs. So a kind of glint in the eyes has yeah. often been noticed that there seems to be a kind of glazed over effect. Yeah. Some groups like Scientology will teach you to, as they put it, confront people, which the rest of us would call staring. Yeah. So yeah. another effect, and, and this was noted to me first by a member, and we'd done an intervention the day before, and he walked down the stairs looking. He's a very fit young man. He was a rugby player in the peak of health. And he was walking down the stairs and he was looking at his arms and he was saying, my arms are pink. Yesterday, my arms were grey. And that's one that's been noted a few times that skin tone can, you know, no excuse for me, I'm afraid. I'm never going to have pink skin. But um, it's always been this way. Um, but there can actually be 
physiological changes in appearance, yeah. physi physiological reasons for changes in appearance, people can become more obsessive. They can yeah. become angrier, but, you know, more, as, as we said, insistent, dogmatic, yeah. pushing an idea. They will always or will usually bring the subject back to their beliefs. When okay. somebody's doing that, going, oh, well, they'll grow out of it, isn't a good attitude. No. It's time to no. find out about the group and it's time to find out about the dynamics of, of group behaviour and group belonging. Yeah. It's yeah. also time to not try and argue with the person and persuade them that, that what they believe is ridiculous or irrational because yeah. that will push them away. And the fundamental thing to do is to strengthen your relationship with the person. Yeah. You know, to yeah. talk about talk about the good things in the past that you shared, you know, yeah. bring out the photo album and remind them of the times you've had together and keep strengthening your relationship. Because if worse comes to worse, something when we were at um, the Manchester International Cultic Studies Association yeah. seminar in 2019, you and I, a, a, a woman came up to me. And she said that um, she was really glad that Scientology had a policy where members of their C organization, C as in a body of water, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that she was really glad that, that her child wouldn't be having any children because it's a rule there, because that child would then grow up in Scientology. And that stopped me dead in my tracks because we're not talking about ISIS here. We yeah. shouldn't get so extreme in our views a child can grow up inside you know there are groups at the other side of the line you know i wouldn't wish it on anybody to grow up in scientology but because they exclude childbearing from that group as monastic groups do in some religions yeah. it means that the child won't be subjected to the horrors that children used to be subjected to in that group and it's fine growing up as scientologist it's it's not like, for example, being in the Children of God, no, uh, or ISIS or MEK. You can, despite the negativity of the experience, for the most part, kids who grow up in Scientology, you know, while having some bad experiences, it's not as bad as growing up with child sexual abuse, for example. So we have to be careful that we're not trying to exclude people and say, well, because you're a, a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or, or whatever, you are no, you no longer have human rights and it'd be better that you didn't have children. No. So, no. But nonetheless, it, it is an experience that will always leave a mark. Yeah. And in, for some people, you know, I look back and I look at Scientology and say, I, I learned so much by my okay. nine-year involvement in Scientology that equipped me, it gave me a toolkit to work in the world. Negatively, it was not things that I learned as a Scientologist uh, from Ron Hubbard. It was things that I learned by being a Scientologist. I learned more yeah. about my own arrogance. <laughs> you know, I learned more about negative aspects of my own character, which sadly I still haven't overcome, but you know, I'm, I'm working on it a little bit. Um, yeah, but it, what, but, what but I'm so, so I came out of the yeah. experience with something positive. It's yeah, it, 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 that needs to be said. The thing is that, I, as I always say, I the lessons I learned have been very valuable. I wish I could have learned them in three weeks rather than nine years. Yeah, but it's it's not to say that uh, I, I do understand. Of course, there are also good things that you can learn. I, I uh, talk with a client who was. Uh, really talking about the also the positive effects of, of being in a cult and not because of it being a cult uh, but because she learned to, uh, to, to to a lot of things about how to uh, deal with the fact that you have less money so how to deal the, the finances not being depending on a lot of money to, to live on to a shoestring exactly so she said that she had a lot of benefit from that and uh, appreciates certain things more than before. Uh, you can even learn certain skills that are needed in the group and outside the group, you can still benefit from that. Chris, Christian Sherko and I, there's a video on the channel here where our dear friend yeah. Christian and I talk about 
you know, you've got to, if you leave such a group, count your blessings as well. Look at what went wrong. But, but often, I mean, I've known quite a number of Scientologists who were put under awful slave-like regimes. And it's meant that when they left, they were able to work like slaves and they built, you know, multi-million dollar businesses or yeah. they became very successful because they had acquired a work ethic um, yeah. that, that sometimes was too much, sometimes was not healthy. Yeah. So boundaries is left. often a thing, boundaries of, of uh, also to, to have, uh, um, to learn how to set a boundary yourself and, uh, but also to limit your own energy level mm. and so that you, you do not put so much energy into a certain thing uh, at the cost of your own physical yes physical boundaries so there is a lot of things that you you can learn um but it's not to say that you have to be in a cult to learn them no and and and, uh, and that's that's just not uh it's of course it's it's good to think back in uh, that you did learn a lot of things but it's not thanks to the cult it's oh. often thanks to your own ability to adapt uh, and um, so I, I do think that, that that's important to think about because people would say, well, it's it's a really, it's like a commune. You're all, all living together uh, and learning to, to work in a group, mm -hmm. to uh, not be selfish and think of one another mm -hmm. and work together. But um, where it goes wrong is that the, the, the person is, uh, is actually learning to what I've said before, to uh, treat themselves more as an enemy and as a person who should not be there. And that's should just not essential be, to what, what I... Yeah, there should not be important. And it. yeah, and just even the, the, the good relationship they have with their parents, with the family members, with friends, and, uh, that they exclude themselves mm. now from the, their loved ones because they uh, then started to, to think that they are not healthy relationships anymore or that they um, prevent them from being a good cult member. The, the, um, worst, the worst exclusion I've met was a man who, um, in the 1960s, Ron Hubbard told him that he was a suppressive person, an anti-suppressive yeah. personality. And for 20 yeah. years, he had locked himself away. He'd not worked. He'd been housebound because he didn't want to hurt anybody. Yeah, that's, um, that's sad. This is really, really sad. Absolutely tragic. Yeah. And when, when I met him and, you know, somebody else had started, the pro his wife, in fact, had really healthily begun the process of getting him out. Um, yeah. uh, but he came to see me and by the end of a three hours, an afternoon, we'd lifted completely this nonsensical idea that he was dangerous to humanity. And I was delighted a couple of weeks later to hear that he got a job and you know, was getting to life. But it does leave you with a, a real frustration that somebody can be convinced in this way of their danger. Yeah, that's the, the power of, of conviction. Like you really, if you really start to believe that that's the truth, then you will act upon it. That's yeah, just the way it is. Groups manipulate your certainty. Yes. But so, and, and we're, you know, Certainty is a subject that we all need to address. Why am yeah. I sure of that? Why do I believe that? Yeah. And um, is it, so I had a friend who was uh, a vegetarian and um, I knew I was introducing her to a, another friend who was uh, sort of a um, little bit of a prickly character, very, very smart. He was in fact a rocket scientist and a psychologist. So, And um, I said to her, he's gonna ask you when we go to the restaurant, why don't you eat meat? And rather than telling him that when you were eight years old, your uncle took you to an abattoir and it disgusted you, tell him it's a personal preference and everything will be fine. There'll be no argument. And she couldn't help herself. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you have to be careful who you're dealing with and, and, and what you say. Yeah, it, not give too much information. Yeah, and it's it, it, it will push a button. It will trigger a response. So yeah. th that first set of things is, is to notice that the person has changed. Something yeah. about them has changed. And okay. they're no longer as strongly in relationship with you as they were. They've transferred their affection. And it's as if the group has become their family. 
yeah and also also the changes in how to uh, how they look at themselves hmm. as as uh, beforehand uh, no problem at all and then uh, or just being human feeling free to just make mistakes and live their lives and be okay with that but um then changing into a person who who thinks that everything they did so far is wrong mm. and that the people around them are also have to stop doing what they're doing that is wrong they have to change this because otherwise things go really really bad so it's of course it's a bit simplified but it's the 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 attitude is more of what i've did so far in life is actually a bit playing around because this is serious stuff now things have to change and now I actually feel I'm alive and I'm doing things and the intention and the motivation is often really really good yeah. and really wanting to to change the world and feeling very motivated to become part of a group that's going to make changes mm -hmm. so it's it's the that feeling of becoming part of a change mm -hmm. that will uh, yeah, change the world for the better uh, themselves for the better and their family just uh, if they don't agree with it they just don't understand and they have to yeah be actually uh, they, they excluding themselves from all kinds of things they would normally do and that is a that's truly a, a signal that they have to pay attention to I, I, what's going on yeah. I'm, I'm reading a book called collective illusions on um, steve hassan's recommendation and um, he refers to a, a social study that was done in, I think, New York State in 1928, where a social scientist started going to a particular church and asking members of the church what their beliefs were. And the, the, the one that interested me was, was it all right to use a deck of cards that had the face cards in it, the Jack Queen King? Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, certain Puritan groups believe that, that this is evil. And oh, wow. the discovery was that I think 77% of the people surveyed said you, you should not use a deck of cards with the face cards in. And oh, wow. but what he found in becoming a member of the community was that actually in, in their homes, many of them actually used cards. You know, they played bridge and things like this. Yeah. And so there's this idea as a group, we're not meant to do this. And what we're meant not meant to do can be very odd indeed. You know, um, one of Artie Shaw, the great clarinetist Artie Shaw, one of his seven wives, um, said that he, he would be really annoyed if you didn't fold the end of the toilet tissue properly after you've used, you know, it had to be folded into a particular thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and these kind of petty rules are typical of controlling people of yeah. authoritarians. Um, and authoritarian groups, cult groups, will impose such rules and it starts to become important, you know, that yeah. you shouldn't eat broccoli, you know, mm. or, or you should never say the word rabbit. Right? And these rules, and then the person who's joined the group, there is a tendency, you're outside of the group and you're looking at the group and the, the idea is the things that the group believes are ridiculous because yeah. of course the things I believe are sensible. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's these small changes that in the beginning it might be just small changes and they see how far they can go. And if you accept and and find it interesting and go along with it, they'll add something else. So it's more of a any of the changes. And, and once you started to accept those and, and make these changes, well, nothing against it. And then uh, it, it's more of a, a more and more influencing you to believe that what they're actually uh, are, are doing or the, the goals they have as a group that is acceptable and makes sense and often it's just the prejudices yeah. and preferences of the leader um, yeah. I've often talked about a friend of mine who um, grew up in Scientology and um, that she'd been out for 17 years she was I think 37 38 when i met her mm -hmm. and um so she'd not been involved in it for all that time she got a degree a medical degree she's a smart woman wow. and um she said said to me um 
Is it true, John, that, that reality is agreement? Because the concept in Scientology is that we are all of us agreeing that the world is here. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what puts it there. And I'm, I sort of said, well, yeah, if you're the hypnotist, but otherwise we all have our different perceptions. And I personally think the universe is out there, whether I'm here to perceive it or not. You know, mm -hmm. it's not me making it up. However, as Immanuel Kant said, we do live inside the world of our own making. Our own yeah. interpretation of the world is very important. Some, yeah. some nonsense like that. And a, and a week later, when I talked with her, she said, I didn't use, uh, I, I've used a scented laundry conditioner in my washing. Now, we hadn't talked about this bizarre aspect of Ron Hubbard's thinking. Ron Hubbard had scent phobia. So did Rajneesh, in fact. Uh, they're hypersensitive to smells. And yeah. Hubbard took it to the extreme that he believed and said, uh, but mm -hmm. not to us public Scientologists, only to the inner circle, that psychiatrists were using rose perfume to control everybody. Oh, and so, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. which led to... They had a lot of influence in uh, what, yeah, what but people... Because He'd got something yeah. psychiatrically wrong with him. He then yeah. imposed it. There's something yeah. wrong with his smell organ. So he'd impose that upon other people. And that will often be the case, that, that people okay. are not playing bridge because the leader of the group says that the, the Jack, the Queen and the King represent something <laughs> that's really, yeah. you know. I, I, I had one, I had um, a Baptist minister who, who decided he ought to exorcise my house. This was uh, in my, with my first wife. And I thought, what an amusing idea. You know, it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to see that. And um, he said, oh, you've got to get rid of those magic books. And it was like, well, they're books that Ron Hubbard read. So yeah. it's relevant to me. No, no, that they'll contain demons, you know, something like that. Yeah. Things yeah. That people come to believe. And yeah. it's very important if somebody does shift into a set of beliefs that contradict your own. Firstly, to understand that we all have odd beliefs please we all have odd yeah. beliefs uh with some people you know in america you can't stay in room number 13 or on the 13th story of a hotel yeah you talk about superstition what an absolute yeah. piece of nonsense but yeah it's real it's real enough to affect absolutely people. yeah it does affect a lot of people yeah so we all have our own vagaries our own mm. things that we like it's dangerous, very dangerous to pick on those, you know, if you love somebody and you're saying, well, why do you believe that black cats are dangerous or walking under ladders or breaking mirrors? Well, you yeah. know, um, you, you don't go to that. You, you instead go towards agreement, things that, that you still agree on, the foods you yeah. like eating. So yeah. it's, it's getting into that positive thing, which feels a little manipulative really mm -hmm. but that's what the group is doing it's yeah. saying you know we we love you we think you're wonderful and that and they really can lay it on with the love bombing yeah. but they in Scientology it's called finding the reality the agreement that yeah. the person has and you just keep going with them I was very surprised when I read the Al-Qaeda recruiting manual and this same point was made mm -hmm. only agree with the person never yeah agree with them but yeah. as a way of maintaining communication so that somebody i have and you've probably had it too i've had situations where somebody had been in a group for 10 or 20 years and there was nobody on the outside who was still communicating with them their own family had said well if you want yeah. to do that and okay. the point is that if you've not had the group attacked and there's somebody outside of the group i had a family where there were five siblings and the parents and the young man had had seven years where he hadn't talked with anybody but one of his sisters. And that's because the sister never said anything bad about the group. Yeah. And so yeah. we were able through her to talk to him and at least get him talking to the rest of his family again. So there has to be a... I, I used to say to people, look, you can treat, treat somebody who's in a group one of two ways. One of them is you can presume they're mentally ill and you can look at it from that attitude and and be as gentle as you would be with somebody who had paranoid schizophrenia or something like this. Be gentle with them. Um, the other is to say, this is a person you've just met and you really want to be friends with. Treat them in that way. 
treating them as, you know, I'm your dad and I know all about everything and you're being stupid. You had mm. one guy who his son had flown back from Oregon to tell him, you know, I'm, I'm not going up to Oxford University. I'm instead I'm going to spend a billion years in Scientology, a thousand million years yeah. in Scientology. And his father, as he came into the room when we first met, looked at him, he said, you look so brainwashed when you came off the plane. That cost me two hours. <laughs> and it really nearly cost me the whole discussion. So okay. insulting, demeaning, humiliating, yeah. expressing your authority, these are not good ideas. No, 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 no pressure, not an absolutely knowing what, what the group is about. So you, you also understand a little bit of the, of the language that's spoken. So you yeah. don't need to, to contradict everything. It's, it's good to just make them to keep on treating them as adults and not as children who just don't know what's good for them. Yeah. Because if you start doing Get that- them to then... explain what it is they believe and sit yeah. and listen. Be curious, just be curious and ask questions and um, just asking questions that uh, make clear that you give room for different opinions and even for doubts. Uh, but but not to just to, to explain also that it's 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 good to have all different kinds of opinions. Like you said, it's not necessary to agree on anything or on everything. Well, what you agree it's on is necessary. what you agree on is that you love the person, and it, and it exactly it exactly and just just okay. Well, that's that's an inter interesting uh, way to look at things. Or but if if there is in a family still room to have different opinions about things and just so keep on supporting one another uh just showing that uh, um uh, unconditional love to one another <laughs> even though you may think differently about certain aspects in life that's absolutely fine but if uh, they feel they they should be ostracized because they think differently well <laughs> That, that, that's not going to help to to keep uh, the family uh, together. So it's um, it's more of a that that may be part of the problem if you uh, if a person uh, becomes interested in such a group and you think well that's just another opinion no problem uh, there they can just explore and do whatever they want and um, but then knowing that where the dangers lie hmm. so that being interested in a different opinion is of course something something else than being involved with a cultic group hmm. so if there is a, a line crossed and they take over too much time and a person is then gradually uh, spending 20 uh, 24 7 Mm. Uh, with the group and with the group members and there seems to be no time left to to be, to stay on being part of the family mm. uh, that it's something uh, well it's good to talk about what the dangers of a cult are and what the signals are so you'll you'll know where to look what to look for mm. uh, but also that the person before he gets too involved knows what to look for mm. And that, so that, yeah. It, I mean, I mean as, as you know, and we've worked together for a long time now, but, but my in, principal interest is in prevention. And, yeah. um, be, because it can take years to recover from a, a cultic experience. You get too involved. Yes. You know that. Yeah. Um, you have to unpick it and, and change the way you think. And for some people, they will never recover. They, they will be, their thinking will have been so overwhelmed that they won't be able to think properly. And no amount of trying will change that. So you can be 10 years later, or as with this guy who came in from Australia, 20 years later, and you're yeah. still, that's your life has, has you know, a large portion of your life has been invested in this. So much better if you can get to kids Yes. And, and there, that's fairly straightforward, this program that, that, that we were advocating when we were working with the Open Minds Foundation, yeah. that it, everybody should read our Achelaf's Intelligent Disobedience. Yes. Which is yes. a great way to start with kids from the age of four or it's five. It's a wonderful book, yes. 
so that you teach kids to be assertive to be able to say that doesn't sound right to me can you explain it yeah. um you you teach them to say well oh, no i'm sorry i'm not persuaded <laughs> you know uh and you know no is 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 a complete sentence when somebody comes you don't have to justify why you don't want to do something um in in my own book opening our minds the idea was very much to show people before the event um mm -hmm. how to recognize predatory people cult recruiters and that sort of thing the techniques that they're going to use yes. which hopefully makes it pretty obvious and, and much less likely so it, you know i'm at the moment working on um curricula for, for kids uh we've got a, a little project in america with a wonderful guy there um we've got a little project here which we hope to make into a big project which yeah, is to teach, wonderful yeah is to teach about you know propaganda and how to mm -hmm. recognize the the fake news that's all around us how to be more sure that you're making your own mind up um yeah. and and seeing the very straightforward tricks that that, that are not actually taught anywhere in our yeah. schools yeah um, perhaps because to some extent, uh, it, to a large extent, I'm afraid, our schools are still authoritarian themselves. They're not places where children grow up to become adults and self-responsible. Mm -hmm. They're places that, you know, cram you with information about mathematics, history and geography and literature that you will never in your life use for the most yeah. part. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, under the name of education rather than teaching you life skills um you know i didn't learn how to hang wallpaper at school that would have been quite useful um you know we're learning how <laughs> to drive a car or, you some know, schools do <laughs> some schools do and and yeah. um what's his name uh sir ken uh he's on the bookshelf here sir ken robinson his books uh the elements and creative schools show that there are indeed thousands of schools that that do look to practice yeah. Skills. just practical stuff yeah but there are hundreds of thousands that don't yeah and, you know so uh how do you look after a baby um what happens when you get pregnant um mm -hmm. not rather than you know rather than don't get pregnant <laughs> what mm -hmm. you know sooner or later you know some yeah. of us will get pregnant and it's good to know what will happen except yeah. of course you, you know you never tell anybody about what it's like giving birth because you really don't want to put them off <laughs> human race too much information too much. it'll be yeah. wonderful you'll feel so good afterwards um but so having the preventative material um opening our minds should be useful for that it should be useful for somebody who's got somebody you know their word is in a cult uh steve yeah. hassan's combating cult mind control always Absolutely great. Yeah. i'm in that now my name's in it isn't that good um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he claims I edited it. I, you know, I, I remember mm. reading it and making a few comments. But um, looking at uh, Janja Lelich's, uh, or in fact Madeline Tobias's book that um, take back your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. If if you're trying to help somebody who's leaving a group and escaping utopia, yeah. If you were born into a group and are sort of putting your head back together, um, it is there any, we must have missed lots of things but it, it, is, is there anything significant that comes to mind that we can offer as advice uh of, of advice to family members you mean, yeah. uh, or what to read uh i think these basic books are are really important like the books of 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 uh, stephen Hassan, understanding uh the bite uh of authoritarian control and so what that's uh of of behavior information thoughts and and uh, emotions because uh, to teach people the more these things are happening the more this kind of control is happening mm. of all terrains of all parts of our lives uh, then there is absolutely uh, um, we have to absolutely accept that it's a culture group we're involved in but the family members can also recognize by reading these uh, these lists of what kind of control there can be they can also recognize if that's happening in the life of their loved ones mm. because if they're not completely 
um, out of contact with their, their family members, they can they have access to that kind of uh, yeah to to see their, their behavior to hear what they're talking about to see how the loaded language is taking over and so all kinds of these these lists of control that you can find in freedomofmind.com is available yeah. so you can just you could just print it out and, and and check all these things happening in the lives of of, of my child of my friend or my father or mother mm. uh, because it's it's also people that come into these these how do you call it um, um middle-aged people who just trying to uh, have to go uh to this kind of training or or um a, a course where we want to just a workshop where we want mm. to learn more about self-awareness uh about all kinds of things it's good to see if one of these things are happening and we see more and more control in this or that area, am I allowed to say no? Yep. Am I allowed to just repeat and do. say, exactly, if, or if I criticize, what will happen if I criticize this or that? Hmm. See what happens. And if you're being scolded or like a child or just made, made fun of, or just you see all of these things happening, uh, and you feel like a, a scolded child, that's not okay. Take it, take five. Yeah. And, I had yeah. a situation where um, many years ago, a, a woman who was a professional counselor with a master's degree found me up in some distress. And she said that she'd gone on a course with the Open University, which is the world's largest university uh, in terms of the number of students. And um, it was, of course, about re-evaluation co-counselling, mm. uh, which was used at that time throughout the Open University uh, because students could do it with each other. You just gave them yeah. this basic manual and they could sit down and they could counsel each other. Yeah. And she, you know, very soon after the course started, she put her hand up and said, this sounds awfully like Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. And um, basically the whole class was sort of, Shh, listen to the teacher. Yeah. And on the second, she phoned me on the, the second day, I think it was. And I said, well, yes, um, re-evaluation co-counseling is absolutely Dianetics. It, it's what Hubbard released in 1950. And what Hubbard, in fact, explained a year later was a hypnotic procedure that should not be used. Then he reintroduced wow. it in 1977. But let's not get complicated. When I approached the Open University, I got this authority thing. You know, it's like, well, we've been doing this for years. It's great. They dropped it two years later because Harvey Jackins, who'd always said that he'd had nothing to do with Scientology, and I sort of provided them with a, a picture of him shaking Ron Hubbard's hand as he took a certificate, you know, which seemed to me good enough evidence. Yeah. Um, but they dismissed it. Then he was accused of um, sexually abusing people and the method disappeared. It's resurfaced since. Um, but that that group dynamic where the people around you go, shh, shh, we, we need to learn. Um, I, you know, I'm going to bring it up. I probably shouldn't, but um, EMDR therapy, which is mm -hmm. spread throughout trained, yeah. qualified it's therapy. used a lot, yes. And Everywhere. there are definitely, I have definite reservations about the way that's taught and about the use of such fairly simplistic methods of hypnosis. Of course, hypnosis can be used helpfully, but uh, recertifying for $500 a year and taking films of your uh, clients, telling them at the beginning of the session that this is for your personal records and asking them at the end of the session if you can share it with your yeah. EMDR people. There are, we need to be, there is no authority that should not be challenged, yeah. really. Yeah. Just because the Pope says it doesn't mean it's necessarily true. Because remember, there were two Popes who said that if you had long hair, you'd go to hell. And they excommunicated people. This is true. There were yeah. two Popes also, not the same two, who um, promoted the use of cocaine in Mariani wine and indeed gave a gold medal to manufacturers of this wine, which had cocaine in and made them feel a lot better. So respect for authority can be dangerous and that ability yeah. to calmly question anything um intelligent disobedience 
and say, yeah. I'm not sure about that. You've not convinced me yet. And okay. I think finally, um, Thulas, Straight and Crooked Thinking, an excellent book written in 1930, updated by his grandson. And he points out that um, the critical thinking movement comes out of this book, as far as I can tell. And one of the things that they say is, if somebody starts getting agitated and upset about what they're talking about, they're no longer being rational. Now, if your beloved person starts getting angry about what you're doing, it's time to bring the temperature down. It's time not to challenge them. It's time to remind them they're welcome. It's time to feed them their favorite food and talk about their favorite film and yeah. share experiences with them that are positive so that they feel comfortable. Do not push them away. And if possible, to make it happen that they can distance themselves by what you plan together uh, for yeah, doing, or you know, just oh, go go away for a couple of days or something, mm -hmm. to take away the routine they have built in that time with the community yeah. or with the group, because distance is very important because then they cannot cannot influence you uh, that way mm. and they have a, a this they need a distance to bring down the anxiety and to uh, really start to think over what they have been discussing all that time yeah and so it's it's often it's just time they need and distance to to get to get closer to themselves again and reconnect and a friend with their you family a friendly environment. I mean, uh, Robert yeah. Lifton found that um, the, the reality of the Sinal, the brainwashing program, uh, and that's what the mm -hmm. Chinese themselves called it. Um, millions of people went through this program in China. And the reality mm -hmm. was that those who stayed in China, there was the reinforcement of the culture always saying this is what, what you've got to see. There's an incredible documentary called One Child Nation, where a uh, a young Chinese woman who's left China five years before goes back to show off her infant in her village and she happens to be a filmmaker and so she records these remarkable interviews and you find out that the tremendous horrors of the enforced abortions yeah. often way past the point where it was safe or proper to do them and the enforced sterilization of women uh, throughout China and the surprising thing is that everybody she interviews and the policy had just been amended to two children. So they presumably have enforced abortions after you've had two children now. Um, but everybody she interviewed said what a, you know, that it had saved China. It was such a positive thing, uh, including women who would had enforced sterilizations. So you come into the group think you come into obedience with the culture. Yeah. You can't question it. And it's important to, to, to keep reality there, to, to mm -hmm. say, um, you know, in that case, the, the thing to say is, well, once uh, you're economically sound, you'll have less children. So that was another way that this could have been done. It's happened naturally yeah. in, in the West, where indeed the reproduction rates have dropped below two people having two children. Um, but it, it's important to that what happened in China is that people, the, the whole culture came to believe the propaganda uh, because of the programme. The 25 people that Robert J. Lifton interviewed to, to make his, write his groundbreaking book, Thought Reform and Psychology of Totalism, yeah, Totalism yeah. in Modern China, 24 of them no longer believed. And so people say, well, well you see brainwashing doesn't work. And you're going, no. One of them still did believe, and he was a Catholic priest, so that's a bit difficult. But the reason they didn't believe was they were no longer in the context of the society. They'd come into, and they what they now were going was, how on earth did I ever believe those things, you know, as you and I feel? So taking somebody out of the context of the group and giving them a, a nice day, giving them a yeah. pleasant experience. Yeah, because all the things have been said, about not being in the group and what will happen if you are with people yeah. outside of the group they have to experience that it's not going to happen so all of these things they are being scared of in in the time it's not going to happen mm. and so they need the experiences the safe in within a safe environment mm. that they they then 
they can cut out lies that way eh? that the, the group told them to keep them close. Yeah, and to experience genuine friendship rather than the faux yeah. friendship that is put forward in the group because the you reality- You can disagree without being punished. Yeah, and people will still yeah. smile. People will still- yeah, Exactly, yeah. To love you. Yeah. And of course, the, the truth, I've talked about this in a video elsewhere, that, that the group doesn't actually love you. That as soon as somebody says you're a bad person, yeah, then uh, off you go. So it, it's that, friendship, that friendship is conditional upon Absolutely. you being yeah. uh, a fee-paying member yeah. of, the, yeah. of the group. But it's good that people, that family members, know about this, that they know how the group works, how the influence works. Mm -hmm. So I would say just print out the the, the, the fight uh, analysis to the, the the pages that are available. And 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 check or even buy the book, see. you know, even oh, yeah. oh, yeah. the author for his decade. Yeah, but at least <laughs> but you at can least. find the bite model in my book also, and and yeah. you, you can have it as an audio book, you can have it as an e-book. We yeah. we haven't done it in Braille yet, but um but did we... you you can recognize if you could just uh, if because what what you do in your book is is also explaining so very well how these different groups actually have the same working method, hmm. the same manipulation method. And once you understand those, then you can also see why they are so effective. Yeah. And recognize them sooner when you see and they run, it happening. They run throughout our society. That was my revelation. Yes. That um, our political groups use them all the time. Our yeah. schools use them. And by recognizing those techniques, we are much better protected against them and the influence they may have upon us um, yeah. and exactly. might even be able to create a better world by not making uh, predatory people our leaders yeah and knowing what unconditional love is all about yeah yeah great yeah. well it, it, it's been fun and um it I, really I has so i hope it, it helps uh, a few people just just looking more closely to to what is happening to uh, their family members. I hope so. Yeah. Now, everything that we provide on this channel is free. It's uh, gratis and for nothing. Um, however, the channel will only continue uh, going forward if it's supported, and we tremendously value our patrons on Patreon. Um, and it seems it seems good to me that if if you if you want people to know this share it with other people but put a couple of dollars in to patreon it's very easy to do and um and we'll keep doing this um and uh hopefully it is useful it's, uh, yeah you. i hope i hope it's useful too yes <laughs> so, thank you very much francis and we'll see you all thank you yes. we'll see you all again okay. yeah. bye. bye bye hi john here thanks for watching We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.